podcast, would you please take a minute to rate and review us on iTunes or wherever you listen to this podcast? No, that's not how you say a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> These headphones are throwing huh? me off so badly because I, I don't sound like myself either. Okay, I'll just start that again. Welcome back to the Modern Lady Podcast. You're listening to episode 86. Hi, I'm Michelle. And I'm Lindsay. And today we are talking about practical ways to love your neighbor. In her diary, Anne Frank once wrote, quote, How wonderful it is that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. End quote. These last few weeks and months have been challenging and difficult for many of us and the chaos and burdens of the world weigh heavily on our minds and hearts. But as Anne Frank rightly noted, we can still have an immediate and massive impact on our society and the world, despite the disorder and confusion. What we need is a game plan. But first, if you enjoyed this episode of the Modern Lady Podcast, would you please take a minute to rate and review us on iTunes or wherever you listen to this podcast? When we receive ratings and reviews, our podcast becomes more visible and easier to find for new listeners. We would also love it if you shared this episode with your friends. Let us know what you think. Your comments mean the world to us. This week's shout out goes to listener Brandy, who left us a five-star rating on iTunes and commented, quote, Michelle and Lindsay put so much prayer, thought, time, and research into their podcast because each episode is so relevant and inspired. I say inspired because every time I listen, I am convicted by the Holy Spirit through their message. Whether it's reevaluating what I'm consuming for entertainment, curbing gossip, or tips for running my house, they hit the nail on the head every time, and I truly believe I'm becoming a better version of myself through their influence. Thanks, ladies. This is more than just a podcast to me. It's a ministry. Thanks for taking the time to produce a quality product that is changing lives. End quote. Thank you so much, Brandy, for your gracious comment and for your support. We are so honored to be able to walk alongside women like yourself as we all strive to hashtag be better and encourage one another in the process. And if you would like to leave us a comment, you can do so on our website, www.themodernlady1950.wordpress.com, or you can leave us a comment on Facebook or Instagram, where you can find us at The Modern Lady Podcast. But before we get into today's chat, Lindsay has our Modern Lady Tip of the Week. Welcome back to part three in this five-part series on calling card etiquette. Today, we're going to look at the secret code used on calling cards. Gentlemen particularly would inscribe initials on calling cards, which explained why he was visiting. These initials were based on French greetings or expressions. PF meant congratulations or pour felicité in French. And I'm going to warn you guys right now, there's going to be a lot of stumbling through French with with all of these initials. PR meant thank you or Monsieur. PC was expressing condolences, or in French, pour condolence. PFNA was Happy New Year, or pour félicité nouvelle an. PP indicated that you wanted to be presented to someone, pour présenté. Why French, you might ask? In 1066, the Normans of northern France invaded England under William the Conqueror. French became the common language in England and was the primary language of all the British kings until Henry V, who was the first to write in English. At the end of the 15th century, English dominated and French became the second language of the cultured elite. And this carried right on through to the Victorian age, especially when being seen as continental was very trendy. France has always led the way in terms of fashion and cooking and etiquette trends, and this is still true today in many ways. It's hard for us to imagine just how important these calling cards were to the Victorian middle and upper classes. A tray in one's front hall that was filled with calling cards was the equivalent of having a large following on social media now. In Our Deportment, published in 1890, John Young observes, To the unrefined or underbred, the visiting card is but a trifling and insignificant bit of social paper. But to the cultured disciple of social law, it conveys a subtle and unmistakable intelligence. 
its texture, style of engraving, and even the hour of leaving it combine to place the stranger, whose name it bears, in a pleasant or a disagreeable attitude, even before his manners, conversation, and face have been able to explain his social position. I find that so interesting. I actually didn't know that France was like the common language in England up Mm -hmm. to a certain point. I didn't think French was a a common language in England at all, ever. Oh, really? No, I had no idea. Actually, a lot of um, 28% of English that, you know, kind of came out of that period is French, is based on French. Mm. And a large other section was Latin, but Latin was used in the churches, obviously, and in the educational institutions. And, um, but French was used in like judicial matters, in law, and in in the royal courts, um, and in a lot of other areas. So a lot, and actually in culinary things, like we call, when we eat a cow, we don't say we're eating cow, we say beef, which is boeuf. So a lot Mm. of like our, our food words actually originated from French as well. Amidst all the noise and suffering and chaos in the world today, it can be easy to feel paralyzed in the face of it all. What can just one person do after all? But when we pause and take a moment to reflect on what exactly it is we are meant to be doing, we can see that we are anything but helpless. Right, Lindsay? Yeah, um, I think... It's easy for us to say right now, like, it's been a, it's been a rough week. It's been a rough month and well, it's been a rough year. (laughs) And I think we're all spinning in circles, going through a whole range of emotions in just one day. Right. And I think that Mm -hmm. you and I've talked a lot about how we're worried that this type of daily and unpredictable stress might have a lot of long-term effects on us. And so we are left just spinning and, and feeling helpless. And so we have to step back and realize too that life is still going on, right? Our friends are still having right. babies. People are still going to chemotherapy. Loved ones are still dying. Home, mm-hmm. The homeless are still homeless. Uh, people are still overdosing. We've had five overdoses in our region this week alone. Uh, mm-hmm. The suicides are on the rise. Like, all, it seems like all we're hearing about still is COVID, but COVID is just one part of a larger hurting world. And we're not saying that right now to be like, doom, 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 like it's even worse than you thought. <laughs> we're here to say, hey, there's things you can do. There are still things that we can do to help. And sometimes we need to really step back and reevaluate the entire situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was thinking about this, that the goal of our lives has not changed. Right. Right. Like we are meant to live lives of love and in service of God and of other people. And it's funny to think that the needs of others have has not diminished in light of everything happening in the world. In fact, it's increased, if anything. Mm -hmm. So we are even more needed right now. And I find this to be a really compelling and convicting thought for us as we go forward. Yeah, you and I were both watching a bit of the coverage from election night last night. Um, We were watching the Daily Wire coverage and we were talking about how we were both so impressed by the conversations that were actually happening between the the men that were there. And they were from all different backgrounds, right? Like there Mm -hmm. were two Jews, there was Catholic men. And they were all talking just about like the culture and what's going on with the election. But there was something that one of them said that really, really struck me. And he said, we're really good at donating money to people who we don't have a connection to. So like Mm. starving kids in Africa here. Sure. Here's my credit card number. Uh, You know, a domestic violence shelter in our own city. Here you go. I can help. But your own brother, he said, like a brother who's had a drinking problem who Mm. maybe hasn't paid you back before. We're like, "Mm, not so sure I can help you. And that really Mm -hmm. stopped me in my tracks because I'm like, am I really helping people? Like really helping people? Who is my neighbor? Like we've had sponsored children for years and we donate every month to several charities, but I literally Mm -hmm. don't know the names of my neighbors across the street. Mother Teresa, or as we call her, St. Teresa of Calcutta, but I think we'll, I'm going to talk about her a lot today. So I think we'll just keep saying Mother Teresa because it's how the world knows her still. But she Mm -hmm. said, quote, It is easy to love the people far away. It is not always easy to love those close to us. It's easier to give a cup of rice to relieve hunger than to relieve the loneliness and pain of someone unloved in our own home. Bring love into your home for this is where our love for each other must start. And this is just so similar to everything we say in almost all of our episodes about it starting at home. And so Mm -hmm. when we talk about these things that we're going to go through and suggest about ways that we can help, these are, you know, things that are on a personal level, but that really can help in our communities and on a universal scale. Right. 
I love that point. And actually, I think it was you that brought it up to me a few weeks ago when we were talking about having to, uh, Pope Francis tells us, to look people in the eyes. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Yeah. Um, like, especially the homeless or the people you pass in the street who are in need. And it, it it's your, like, instinct. I know it's mine, like, to my shame. Like, often, sometimes I, I look away. Right. But for that reminder to be like, no, it humanizes people. It, it keeps that exactly what you're saying to the front of your mind that, no, these people are not far away. <laughs> like the need is so great and it is right here in front of us. Like we need to really have the fortitude and then the perseverance to to take care of those of us, those who are in immediate need immediately around us. Yeah. And this is the loving your neighbor part, right? And again, mm. like most of our episodes, we will redefine love um, using St. Thomas Aquinas's def definition of willing the good of the other. And Bishop Barron always likes to emphasize that it is willing the good of the other for the other. Like we're not part of the mm. equation actually here at all in what mm. love actually means. This isn't the, the feeling of love here. Here, the warm and fuzzy feeling, that feeling might be a byproduct of what happens when we act on that love for others. But when we talk about willing the good, we mean their ultimate good as well right. as their temporary good, right? It's fulfilling their eternal needs as well as their um, immediate needs. Like you're saying, we can feed their hunger and we can feed their souls. We can close someone with clothing and we can give them that dignity. Like what you're saying about meeting the eyes of everybody that you pass, especially right now when all you can see is someone's yeah. eyes because of the masking. <laughs> Right. It's never been easier to see some, <laughs> yep. somebody's eyes. Yep. <laughs> no, that's so true. Do you know what? Going along with that, I, I think of a connection to charm and what mm. we were talking about a couple of weeks ago with uh, charm being the ability to put other people's at ease in oh, your yes, presence. Yes. Right. And I, I know what you're saying because I saw a few articles online, actually there are quite a few, talking about the psychological benefits to ourselves when we do good for other people. Mm -hmm. um, and so that kind of, at first glance, kind of contradicts what Bishop Barron was explaining. that We do the will the good of the other for the other, not yeah. for ourselves. And yep. so that seems a little bit in contrast until I kind of started thinking, well, could it be a spiral effect, though? Like, mm -hmm. could it be that when we give to other people, we receive more for ourselves, which can then be all as well given to someone else? Yeah. So it, how, how I thought about this is, you know, the more I look after the physical needs of others, there are undeniably benefits to myself, too, which is great. It doesn't have to be the motivating factor here, though. And if I then am settled and consistent, especially when reaching out to others. Are there now underlying sufferings I can now also help alleviate, right? Have they been, now that they've been fed or clothed or housed, now that they see that I'm someone who is grounded and can be counted on, I'm, I'm a certain type of a person, would they feel more comfortable or willing to be even more vulnerable in sharing what's going on inside of them that mm -hmm. could need tending to as well? The loneliness that Mother Teresa was talking about, uncertainties, doubts, or struggles that they may be going to now that the the triaging of the material needs has been met. I love that, the, the triaging of material needs. Do you know who mm -hmm. agrees with you? Who? Jesus. <laughs> that's best right? person to feel like he agrees with you <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> I was um I was reading Matthew Matthew chapter 25 and because that's where they you know Jesus says the for I was hungry and you gave me food I was thirsty and you gave me drink a stranger and you welcomed me naked and you clothed me and ill and you cared for me in prison and you visited me this is where the Catholic Church got the corporal works of mercy from but right before mm. that passage is something I was reading a little bit before that. And it's exactly what we were just saying. It's the story of, um, I forget who it is, but he's giving these people like these, these gifts and some, like, it's essentially Jesus saying like, I've given you these talents. Right. And the, some, mm -hmm. the first person came back and said, wow, you gave me five and I've multiplied it. And so there's more now I'm coming back to you with more. And he's, and Jesus is so proud. And then the second person goes, you gave me two when I'm coming back with four, like I doubled the gifts. And the one person scrolled it away. Like they buried it in the dirt and Jesus is like, mm -hmm. get away. Like, he's really mad at you. <laughs> cannot 
this is again, like, it's not always happy, Jesus. He's not happy if you take what gifts he has given Mm. you and you bury it away and nothing comes out of it. Mm. And so that's where the whole well done, good and faithful servant comes from is. And that's what we all want to hear when we stand before Jesus one day. And so these gifts that he's given us, it isn't always financial, right? Like we don't all have the money or the time or a car to go out and like Mm -hmm. deliver all these things to people. But there are things that we can do and that these little gifts that he's given us that we can multiply it ourselves and then present it back to him and go, look at what I've done with this one thing you've given me. Right. And so these corporal acts of mercy then, corporal Mm -hmm. meaning that it, you know, it pertains to our I'm assuming like corpus. Our body, <laughs> yes. yes. A Latin? <laughs> yes, well done. Yes. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, these corporal acts of mercy then, we can use these as a springboard to take control, take back control of that which we have control over. That's right. right. The world feels like it's spinning out of control, but I mean, it's realistic for us to sit back and say like, but I'm not, <laughs> you know, a, a prelate in the church or Mm -hmm. I'm not a politician. Like that's not my particular career or calling. Um, But that's not the only place where you have influence and you have an impact to make things better. And so this really is the the church's list anyways of the corporal acts of mercy. And then there are also spiritual acts of mercy too. But today I think we're just going to focus on the physical needs that we can address in our own sphere of influence that can really help us take back that control in our little pockets and corners, which when you put them all together on mass really is, is something big. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's the world. So all of our Mm -hmm. corners, right. You're right. And we, we do these things. This, this can spread around the world. It's so easy. Like you're saying for us to sit back right now and be like, wait a second, the church did this or the bishops did this or the politicians are doing this. I mean, these are literally the conversations that are happening all over Twitter at this very moment. But you, what Mm -hmm. have you done? Um, Mm -hmm. Was it Fulton Sheen who said, show me your hands? I think it was, Um, you know, show me your hands. Are they, Blistered from giving, mm. show me your feet. Like there's a, a beautiful quote. I can't, I have a thousand quotes written in my notes today, but I don't actually have that one. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not one of them. <laughs> that's not one of them. But you guys get what I'm saying. So these, yeah. there are seven corporal acts of mercy. I'll list them now, but we're going to break them all down a little bit later. But they are number one, to feed the hungry. Number two, to give drink to the thirsty. Number three, to clothe the naked. Number four, to give shelter to the homeless. Number five, to comfort the sick. Number six, to visit the imprisoned. Number seven, to bury the dead. And I know hearing that list again, we could sit back and be like, well, I can't visit the imprisoned. I can't bury the dead. We have got some tips for you (laughs) for (laughs) how that you actually can do those things in your life. But I want to go back a little bit to when I had very, very young children in my home. And I remember reading a, a blog post saying, mamas out there, you have little children. You were basically doing these corporal acts of mercy every day when you have little children. And, um, I think that that really was a great, it was like a hug, right? From Mm -hmm. the world saying, you can just rest in the knowledge that you're living out the gospel in your daily life when you are drowning under a pile of dirty diapers and you haven't slept. And that did, Mm -hmm. it kind of removed a weight from my heart at that time. And it helped me to start to wrap my head around the fact that my daily life, although it seems mundane, is already set up with all of the tools needed to help me grow in holiness. And that, again, that my work within our little home can Mm -hmm. impact the outside world. And so I did find great comfort in that. So if that's the stage you're in right now, where all you can do is feed, clothe, and give drinks to the little people within your own house, (laughs) Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're doing these, these works of mercy. Yeah, 100%. Because even that quote from John Paul II, where he talks about as goes the family, so goes the world. Mm -hmm. And it, you mentioned it before, but it was actually Mother Teresa, right? Who said, if you want to change the world, go home and love your family. Yep. So, I mean, uh, yeah, doing the corporal acts of mercy to those within your own four walls is the school of charity. <laughs> that's that's where you learn it in the, where we learn it in the first place. And so how wonderful it is to tend to these little souls that were put directly into our care, mm-hmm. the souls of our husband, the souls of our mothers and our sisters and brothers, and those in our very own families, um, that in and of itself will have an impact in the wider world too. 
And I think that it's time we just acknowledge that as women, we were uniquely created to have the desire to care for others. And regardless Mm -hmm. of your state in life and if you're married or not, like, I think it's so interesting that Mother Teresa is Mother Teresa, that we use the word mother for a woman, an abbotus or an abbess, abbess, right? Mm -hmm. Um, who runs um, nuns, who's in charge of a group of nuns. And so she's Mother Teresa. The other woman that you and I took a lot of inspiration from from this episode is Mother Angelica. So I think this idea of spiritual motherhood is just tapping into this this natural and and, and innate desire we have to care for people. And I didn't fully have that in me until I became a mother. Um, And so it was definitely switched Mm. on when I became a mother. And I think a lot of mothers will agree with me that I would mother anyone now. Now, right? Like I just want to wrap anyone right. in my arms. Like it's going to be okay. Let me read you a bedtime story. And have you so, eaten anything? Yeah, yeah. Have you eaten something? <laughs> yeah, <Right. laughs> yeah. You look hungry. Let me get you something. Like that's right. And there are women who haven't had their own biological children who do an incredible mm-hmm. job at this, like Mother Teresa and Mother Angelica, who we can learn from. But it's this concept of spiritual motherhood, this this desire to take care of others. And so, if you happen to be in a stage in your life where you're not physically running after little children. Um, maybe you're working from home and so you, you're even saving that little bit of commuting time. You would might have a little bit of extra time right now and you're thinking, okay, I hear you. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. how do I do these corporal acts of mercy? Right. Okay. So let's start at the beginning. So the first one is feeding the hungry. So Mother Teresa, or again, as we call her, St. Teresa of Calcutta, famously said, if you can't feed a hundred people, just feed one. Mm. It seems obvious to suggest, okay, guys, you you know, you can always donate food to a food bank or volunteer to soup kitchen, but we're going to go a little deeper here. I did some work with our local food bank a couple of years ago, and I remember them telling me that receiving financial donations was far more beneficial for them because they receive some government grants to help purchase food and they get some discounts at grocery stores. And I don't remember the exact figure, but I remember being shocked that it was something like every dollar donated would get them about $7 worth of food when they Mm. use all of their connections. And I don't know if this is true in every city, but it's definitely worth asking because I think so many of us, and I'm guilty of this too, will just like quickly ransack through our cupboards and pull out the old cans of tomato paste or lima beans, right? The things that we thought we'd cook with, but we never would. And that's what we donate. And I think that this is where we can think, you know, it's time to to do a little bit better quality donating on my part. So either buying um, the food that they actually need, or perhaps actually giving just some money to our local food banks. Mm-hmm. That's a really good point. I think I remember that too from my my dad helps with the St. Vincent de Paul mm-hmm. Society as well. And they, they also do appreciate um, you being able to use their connections to be more yes. efficient and effective, right? So yeah, yeah w- with these corporal acts of mercy, and I think in particular with this one in Feeding the Hungry, um, we are uh, we are permitted and in fact probably encouraged to be smart <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. about it, right? Um, so yes, of course, giving physical food, giving a physical loaf of bread to someone who is hungry is good. Um, but then also taking a look at the bigger picture in maybe a more organizational way and saying, well, I could buy, I could, they could get seven loaves of bread if I do it this way. Right. Both of them have equal merit. Yeah, you're so right there, Michelle. There are so many organizations that could use our help where we don't actually have to physically be in the soup kitchen if we don't want to be around that right now, you know, with COVID. Um, I know that our parish used volunteers just to make the sandwiches. So whether it's one one loaf or you're, you want to be, participate in that on a grander scale, there's so many different ways to actually help. You just have to say, hey, what can I do? Now, Something else to consider is about when you host people in your own home and you feed them in your own home. And this can be, you know, a beautiful dinner party. We're not, it's not always just coming Mm -hmm. in terms from poverty, right? It's about being hospitable. Mother Angelica said, um, when I was listening to her talk about the corporal acts of mercy, that if we're to treat everybody coming into our home, like a pilgrim, that they're mm. stopping on their wherever wherever they're at in their journey towards Christ. Um, we are a stop on that journey. And so how do we welcome them into our home when they're here? And so it's something that we've really started to do as a family. We were treated so well by a couple at our church whose children are, are grown, you know, they're in their twenties. Um, who, as soon as they met us, they were like, let us feed you, come over. And I, you know, I always said like, everybody does, what can I bring? What can I bring? Mm-hmm. And she forcefully always said nothing. And I mean that, like, we mm-hmm. want to serve you. We remember what it's like with little kids. And 
we would go and they would order a bunch of food for us and they would just take care of us. And, and now that's been over the last couple of years of a friendship with them. And we're coming to the point where we can do that now. We're saying, mm-hmm. bring nothing. I want to serve you. I want to provide this full meal for you, wine and all and all the things. What a lovely gift, that gift mm-hmm. of hospitality. And it does cost money and it does take time. Um, and so never underestimate that that is an act of mercy for people. And if you treat it like, a stop on their pilgrimage in their life and really understand that the whole evening can have an impact on on them and on their families. We realize that it is a beautiful gift that we can give. Yeah, I really like that. And I was thinking along the same lines that feeding the hungry almost needs kind of a parentheses at the end of it uh, with like with you there Mm -hmm. (laughs) in some Mm -hmm. in some way. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, Whether that is a spiritual accompaniment like you you give and accompany that uh, material means with your prayers Mm -hmm. um, or in in a in a great way as well as you're saying, like you actually sit down and eat with people Mm -hmm. (laughs) or if you are able to contribute some of your time to a soup kitchen, that you are making that eye contact with people, that you're talking to people, people can be hungry hungry in more ways than just physical hunger, yeah. right? I, I think feeding the hungry could also be, uh, you know, extended towards feeding the hunger of uh, companionship and love and human contact. Yeah. As you know, Michelle, we would do socials before COVID. We would do socials in our church basement, right? After every mm-hmm. mass. Mm-hmm. And um, again, in the same vein, we would have a few of our parishioners always put in the money and pay for pizzas and put, you know, we'd, people could give little donations if they wanted, but it really was an outpouring of charity from a few people of our community who would make sure that there was a full spread of food enough to feed 150 people every Sunday after mass. Mm-hmm. And occasionally because we were an inner city church, we would get some homeless people who would come in, wander down and we would always feed them. And it wasn't just like, here, take your pizza and move along. Nope. I would mm-hmm. put my arm around some of these buddies and, you know, bring them over to sit with my own children um, mm-hmm. at a table and would continue to bring them food throughout the meal. Like they, we weren't just feeding them and then sending them on the right way. They were welcome to sit and have that companionship time with us during our church socials. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the second one is to give drink to the thirsty. Now, um, I thirst is what Jesus said from the cross. And these two words were displayed beside every cross in all of mother Teresa's communities. Mm-hmm. And there's a ton of commentary written about just those two words and what Jesus meant. And we can pretty much assume it's a double thirst, like what you were saying with the hunger, Michelle, Mm. that, you know, people are thirsting in their bodies. So one is of the body, but one is of the soul. And so we can kind of imagine I've never been lost in a desert. I've never been truly thirsty because I've been blessed with having water at my fingertips everywhere I go. But if we can imagine how delicious that cup of ice cold water is, if you're, if you're truly thirsty, um, and what that also looks like in a symbolic way for the soul, right? If you've been watering in the desert and, and being Mm -hmm. able to feed, give them that nourishment and that ice cold cup of water through the gospel message. Yeah. And I like what, um, I think it was Mother Angelica's talk when she mentions the, the cold water specifically, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. (laughs) When she says like, give them cold water and it's a, it's that call to, you know, consider them above and beyond. Mm -hmm. Right. So water, when you're thirsty, any, any temperature of water (laughs) will be fine. Right. If you're thirsty, but to, get cold water in those times in Jesus's time, say meant an extra effort on your part. You had to go to the well, you had to draw fresh water up from the ground. Otherwise it was warm. Right. And, um, that's specifically mentioned, like give them a cool glass of water. And it's that call for us to remember, like there, there is always area to go above and beyond for the care of someone else. And all that does, in addition to giving them something to drink, is raising their dignity. We're mm-hmm. all about raising the dignity, the God-given dignity of every human being. And that is just an extra added little elevation that we can offer someone else. So speaking of that, I don't know if you've ever heard about this, but there is a remarkable thing that two professors did in our community called the Waterloo Pump. Have you ever heard about this? Mm, no, I haven't. In the late 1970s, two professors from one of our local universities, the University of Waterloo, were approached to help develop a hand pump 
for people in developing countries so that they could have access to clean water. Mm -hmm. Now, normally these pumps were made of um, iron or steel and they were incredibly heavy. They were hard to transport into these remote locations, specifically in Africa. They were almost impossible to fix. You had to have like a blacksmithing shop set up and skilled labor and they rusted. It just, they were not even though they were rudimentary designs, they were just not feasible in developing nations. So these men observed our local Mennonite communities. We are in a Mennonite area mm-hmm. and they watched their water pumps and they created a design, a design that used like a piston action, but it was actually made from plastic and wood. And plastic is just a much better option actually in these developing countries because they actually have access to like plastic molds and the production of that is a little bit easier where they are and Mm -hmm. it lasts longer and it's light and easy to, to move and, you know, into these different areas. So they designed this pump and they brought it to those communities. And they also then taught those communities how to build and repair these pumps. And they could use the materials that they had around them, like wood, they had to learn how to carve the pieces for this wood. And so not only did these people get for the first time for many of them, fresh, cold drinking water. They also learned new skills and they felt like it wasn't just a handout. This is like Mm. what you were saying. It gave these people dignity and these pumps are still being used today. And they were brought there by our local two professors. That is amazing. I had no idea, but what a great illustration of this corporal act of mercy. I love that. Literally and phys- and <laughs> <laughs> in an analogy way. <laughs> Absolutely. There's something else too. I was reading on the Divine Mercy website about how it's also important that we should conserve water um, mm. in our own homes. I'm terrible at wasting stuff, but that we shouldn't waste it because it also helps them form in our minds and our hearts and in our children, just how important it is to have access to clean drinking water and what a luxury that really is for us. And, Mm -hmm. and that, you know, will then shape our um, opinion of those around the world who don't have it and maybe what else we can do to help them. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. So the third one is to clothe the naked. Um, I know we can all have a giggle again when we think about the moms chasing down naked kids. Oh, my goodness. The word in our house is nuked because it's nude and naked put together. (laughs) I had many, many a nuked kid. Um, So we all know that that is an actual act of mercy when you're having to hold down a child and put their clothes on them. Um, But let's talk about, you know, the rest of the people. It's not like we often see, you know, naked Mm -hmm. people in our culture. It's it's something that it's not something we think that we encounter all of the time. But Mm -hmm. I think something that I've heard over and over again is that, again, like kind of with when we're cleaning out our pantries and we donate food, when we're cleaning our closets, we'll just throw anything into a bag and drop it off. Like those people um, aren't worthy of our better quality clothing. They're getting Mm -hmm. to rip the stained. And I think that it's time we step back and really think about that, that maybe it's time we give some of our better clothing and we donate that to people. And that got me thinking about specialty clothing. Uh, For instance, like charities that take wedding dresses, right? For women Mm. who can't afford a wedding dress or for there's a lot of charities that take them for miscarried or stillborn babies and they'll cut the wedding dresses up and they'll make them into beautiful burial garments. Um, I donated my Mm. wedding uh, gown to one of those years ago and I actually gathered um, 13 other wedding dresses from friends and we dropped them off about an hour from our house to a seamstress. But what we also gave her was a gift card to Walmart because they also need to buy like the thread and like trim and those kinds of things when they're creating those, those little burial gowns. And so the money towards that can help. So if you aren't really ready to part with your wedding dress, consider donating, you know, thread or ribbon or all those things to some of these other charities. Um, there are also the charities that collect old suits that are still in good mm-hmm. condition or work clothes, right? For, for people who need to go on a job interview who haven't been in a long time and, and don't have the right clothes to wear to that um, or prom dresses. So, so I'm thinking more like specialty clothing. There's plenty of that around. How can you help in, in those areas? Mm-hmm. That's a great point. And I was even thinking too, like with the colder weather coming on this time of year too, mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. there are a lot of people in our own communities that need to be able to face it, the elements as well yeah. in the weather yeah. too. So that's another aspect of specialty clothing is um, what I'm trying to say to consider, um, you know, and this will probably feed right into shelter the homeless too, but to consider the whole life of the other person and the needs that they would have. This is 
uh, on a basic level, just basic consideration of Mm -hmm. someone else, right? And I think we see in our culture that the basic consideration sometimes really isn't there. So what a great exercise for us to really sit and think, what is something that someone might need for every aspect of their life and what they might, um, yeah, have need of to face all those things? Yeah, I love that. That actually leads into one of my other things is, is, um, knitting well i had here prayer shawls um i'll talk about that in a second but when i think about the women who knit those right they also Mm -hmm. are likely the women knitting the baby hats right all different sizes for the little preemie heads right up to my giant 11 pound baby's head who's like the size of a five month old um so they're um that's right from birth right till sadly a lot of people's ends when my mother-in-law was dying and actually when my my grandmother was dying they were in hospice and they were given these beautifully knitted prayer shawls because they were cold and they would be wrapped Mm -hmm. around their shoulders and it was something that we wrapped up and passed along to family because that was the last thing that they were wearing and they were beautiful and it just gave them again a little bit of dignity when they're in hospital gowns and hospice or something to have this beautifully handmade shawl wrapped around them and the connection with those is that when the women are knitting them they're praying they're Mm -hmm. praying for whoever it's going to go on and that's i absolutely love that um Another thing, again, that you can make for people and and give away specifically right now with COVID is we have a woman in our neighborhood who's been making for free fabric masks Mm. and hangs them on the tree outside of her house. And she, every day she goes out and replenishes them and you can drive by her house, anybody. And she does children, she does older ones, and you can just take masks for free and they're beautiful off the tree. And she just, yeah, she sits at home and does that. And if you need a specific size, you can just send her an email. She has her email out there and she'll leave it in a little box on her porch for you. What a beautiful gift of generosity to do, to do that Mm -hmm. for people. And again, like going deeper beyond even just the physical needs too. Sometimes I think about clothing the naked as, you know, sometimes, you know, when you feel really raw, (laughs) like really vulnerable, um, we all have phases that we go through and and some to varying degrees too, depending on um, the circumstances of your life or the phase of life you're in. Sometimes we just feel rubbed raw and we feel exposed and sometimes I think to clothe the naked could be that act of accompanying somebody who feels very vulnerable Mm -hmm. or to protect somebody um, who's going through something either by means of providing them space to rest or (laughs) space to sit quietly um, and heal if they need to Um, but also it this comes in form of encouragement to other people, right? When I'm feeling down, I find such comfort and consolation to someone who will clothe me <laughs> with encouragement. And so oh, I think I that's that. another aspect that, you know, it takes nothing of our physical means, but could mean so much to someone else who is in, who is vulnerable like that. Okay, it's time for our What We're Loving This Week segment of the show. So, Lindsay, what have you been loving this week? I haven't loved it, Michelle. I have mixed feelings about the thing mm. I'm going to talk to you about, okay? Okay. So, I, I mentioned this on Insta Stories, but I finally read Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. Mm. And have you read it? No. Okay. <laughs> I All right. not, but I saw your I saw your comment on it. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I was trying to hold it going. in. Yeah, and wait for <laughs> this moment, but I couldn't. So anyways, I picked it up a few times as a teenager. I own a beautiful copy from I think the year 1909. And so I'd leafed through that a bit when I was a teenager. And I was expecting like the tortured star-crossed love story of Heathcliff and Catherine of Kathy. Mm-hmm. And instead at 40 years old. <laughs> what I saw now is it was an expose basically into the life of a vicious and abusive man. Mm. Heathcliff was the worst villain I have ever enco- ever encountered in a book. And I have read a lot of books. He wow. was awful. I was shocked, actually, like absolutely shocked by the amount of torture and abuse and just down like absolute violence in Wuthering Heights. Now, there were moments of great writing. And and there really Mm -hmm. was. But my biggest takeaway from this book was what on earth did Emily Bronte go through that could inspire Mm. her to write a book like this? You know, I know some people still lift up their relationship, Heathcliff and Kathy, um, 
as as this love story of uh, you know that he was avenging her or like his own past there's just there's no excuse for the violence i read mm. in that book it was really really shocking and so i want to warn some of our listeners because i have had some who've written me that their like 16 or 17 year old daughters are going to read it and i think that mm. that's fine but i think there needs to be a conversation that this is not an example of love that this is not ever how a man should treat a woman because i had not heard one person say that in mm. all of the times i've heard this book referenced until i read it i was I was absolutely shocked. So I'm sorry. Um, I couldn't find a single redeeming character trait in him. And I just needed to get that off my chest. So not your usual what I'm loving this week. (laughs) Okay. Well, that's a good point to make because I'll be honest with you. It's a title that you see on all the lists, Mm -hmm. right? Of the books that you need to read. But there isn't really a ton of commentary on it. Not like Mm -hmm. Pride and Prejudice. Right. Uh, um, Maybe you can can tell these things by how many memes people are able to make of them. Like... If if it's not memeable, there mm-hmm. might be something to consider further. <laughs> yeah. Now, if anybody has a different view on it, please reach out to us. I'd love to know. And Michelle, you, I need you to read it. I'm sorry. Like maybe okay. on like the dark, stormy winter nights that are coming, read Wuthering Heights. But yeah, I was really shocked. <laughs> Okay. All right. And we'll, uh, we can all read together and discuss. <laughs> Thank you. So what have you been loving or maybe not loving <laughs> over the last <laughs> week? <laughs> Well, I, I, I like this enough. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, we watched a movie, uh, The Call of the Wilds, oh, starring yeah. Harrison Ford. Yeah, we watched this for family movie night last week. And yeah. you know what? It was really delightful. Oh. Um, I've actually never read any of Jack London's books myself. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, this is actually a great impetus for us to really dig into them, especially mm-hmm. this winter when we're yeah. homeschooling this year. Uh, so Call of the Wild follows the story of Buck, who is this really big hearted dog who uh, is uprooted from his life in California. And then he finds himself on a mail delivery dog sled team in Alaska. And from there, he goes on this journey. And it's it's actually quite introspective <laughs> as well, I think. Um, he and the characters that he meets along the way are all really seeking to find out who they really are. Mm-hmm. Um so you know what? It was exciting and adventurous, but not too intense, making it a, a great family movie and a great choice. Um, my youngest really liked it. She's uh, four and a half years old. Um, and it also made us want to consider getting a dog again. So there is that. <gasps> <Yes>. <laughs> but I don't know how that would um, logistically work for us at this point. But uh, just be forewarned. They do a good job of CGIing the dog's faces. And it's going to pull on your heartstrings. So oh. there you go. <laughs> I read that book last year. And it was so oh. good. I, it did take me a couple chapters to realize it was from the dog's point of view. <laughs> and I don't know if that's how it is in the movie too. He's the main char- like He's the main character. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, definitely a great read aloud book for, with your kids. It is the perfect winter read. So I'm, I'm, you know what? We'll watch that this weekend with our kids. Thank you. Okay, that's going to do it for us this week. If you want to get in touch and chat with us about our topic today, you can find us on our website, www.themodernlady1950.wordpress.com or leave us a comment on Facebook or Instagram at The Modern Lady Podcast. I'm Michelle Sachs, and you can find me on Instagram at MM Sachs. And I'm Lindsay Murray, and you can find me on Instagram at Lindsay Homemaker. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great week, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.